All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Impact Webinar Series. My name is Dan Horgan. I am the Senior Director of Corporate Engagement with Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership. Before we kick things off today, I just want to do a couple of quick uh, logistics for everyone. First, I just want to acknowledge that we have a fantastically diverse group uh, that has joined us and has registered for today's session, representing multiple sectors, including mentoring programs, higher education institutions, uh, philanthropic partnerships, including corporations and foundations, as well as government agencies. So we're really excited that you were able to join us today. We also wanted to let you know that all of our participants on today's session are in mute mode, just to ensure the quality, uh, the sound quality as we record today's session and make it available to all of you afterwards. Uh, if at any point in time, though, that you have a question or you have comments regarding the content that we are sharing, uh, please make sure you use the chat box located on the right side of your screen. I'll be monitoring that box throughout the course of today's session, and we'll leave plenty of time at the end uh, to be able to moderate any questions that you have for our panelists today. Also, just want to call out that on the right side of your screen, you'll see that we've uploaded one handout. Uh, one of our speakers today will share a little bit more context on that handout, but we're super excited that you can access it there. We will also send it out with a recording of today's session uh, as well. And so without further ado, I'd love to turn it over to Mike Geringer, our first panelist, to do a quick introduction. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Mike Geringer. I'm Mentor's Director of Research and Evaluation. Uh, it's really great to be with you today. Ragnar? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, so my name is Ragnar von Schieber, and I'm from Genentech, where I lead volunteerism and employee giving programs. Just to give you a little bit of background of Genentech, we founded the biotech industry 40 years ago. We make medicines for over 40 different life-threatening diseases like cancer, Alzheimer's, and MS. And we have about 15,000 employees in our headquarters just south of San Francisco in a city that's called South San Francisco. And I'm excited to be here to share a little bit about how we've partnered with South San Francisco Unified Public School District on an initiative called Future Lab, which is K through 12 STEM commitment to getting public schools excited, public school students excited, engaged, and equipped to do science, and mentoring is a key component there. Excellent, thanks, Ragnar. Katie, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, hi, this is Katie Kubina. I'm the Senior Vice President for Mission Programs at Sea Research Foundation, which is also known as uh, Operates Mystic Aquarium, which is located in Mystic, Connecticut. Uh, the mission of Mystic Aquarium is to inspire people to care for and protect our ocean planet through conservation, education, and research, and I'm fortunate enough to oversee the areas of conservation, education, research, and exhibits, and uh, youth development has been a part of our DNA for um, for as long as we've uh, been around with our current president. And through that, we've been able to foster a program called STEM Mentoring, which we'll hear more about later. Excellent, thanks, Katie. And last but not least, Mike, I'll turn it over to you. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mike Kennedy. I'm founding director of a science education center at Northwestern called Science and Society. Our mission is twofold. First, we work with community partners to develop, implement, and support science education program. Um, I'll quickly restart. Um, again, I'm Mike Kennedy. I'm founding director of a science education center at Northwestern called Science and Society. And our mission is twofold. We work with community partners to develop, implement, and support science education programs across Chicago and Evanston, where our two campuses are located here. Second, we train Northwestern students, faculty, and staff how to do this work in a community-centered longitudinal way. And the program I'll be sharing today is called Science Club. It's an after-school mentoring program for middle school students developed in collaboration with the Boys and Girls Clubs of Chicago and teachers in Chicago Public Schools. Excellent. Thanks, so Mike. And I just want to apologize. I think we had a minor technical issue. I think everyone was able to see our screen, but not necessarily hear us. So I will apologize to all of you and also to our panelists. If I could just ask Katie, Ragnar, and Mike, if you could just do a quick introduction, and then we'll jump into the core of the session. Katie, could I ask you just to do a quick intro again? Yeah, sure. Katie Kubina here. I'm the Senior Vice President for Mission Programs at SU Research Foundation. Uh, which also operates Mystic Aquarium in Mystic, Connecticut. 
Excellent. Ragnar? Yeah, so my name is Ragnar von Schieber, and I lead volunteerism at Genentech, which is a biotech company um, in South San Francisco. And I'm excited to talk about our K through 12 STEM commitment to public school students in South San Francisco. Excellent. And Mike Geringer? Yeah, hi, everyone. Mike Geringer. I'm Mentors Director of Research and Evaluation. Um, and so I kind of lead our research and research to practice efforts, including uh, the new uh, STEM supplement for the elements of effective practice that we'll be talking about today. So very excited to talk about uh, this new product. Excellent. Thanks, everyone. So just to get us started, uh, I'm going to breeze through these next couple of slides pretty quickly. But if you are not familiar with Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership, we just wanted to give you a quick overview of our work uh, across the country. So our mission is really to fuel the quality and the quantity of mentoring relationships for young people across America, ultimately closing the mentoring gap uh, for those one and young, three young people that are growing up without necessarily the critical support they need to be successful at school, at work, or in communities uh, themselves. We've been at this work for over 26 years and really focused on providing the training, the technical assistance, the awareness and advocacy, as well as increasing the overall investment in the mentoring field. None of this work would be, would be possible without incredible partnerships across sectors. We support a network of over 2,000 mentoring programs that are in communities all across America on the front lines, really facilitating and managing these mentoring initiatives and relationships ranging from City Year to 4-H to Youth Build, all sorts of mentoring organizations, uh, many of which I'm excited that are in the STEM-focused area uh, that we'll be hearing from today. We also work in partnership with our affiliate network. Our affiliates are in 26 states and regions across the country, doing similar work to what we do at a national level within their states and regions. Again, advocating for uh, mentoring investments, helping to raise awareness of both the need and the impact of mentoring, and providing the critical training and technical assistance that's needed to really elevate uh, the impact of mentoring programs and expand their overall scope. In addition to our nonprofit partnerships, we also work with public, uh, we also work with many corporations and foundations across the country, including Genentech, as well as several others that you see on your screen here. We help these companies not only to develop or scale their mentoring initiatives, but we also work with them to invest in the mentoring field so that we can close that mentoring gap and really put forward the necessary research that we all need to ensure that we're advancing the most effective mentoring practices. As I mentioned, the, the need for mentoring is, is clear. We know from our research that one in three young people are growing up without access to a caring adult outside of their family that's really providing them consistent support on a regular basis uh, to be successful academically, again, at work or in their communities. And in order for us to close that gap, we oftentimes have to make the business case for why mentoring is important. And also from our research, the mentoring effect, which is available on our website at mentoring.org. We know from asking young people themselves what impact mentoring can have on them. It can help them improve their academics and increase their attendance at school. It can help motivate them to engage in volunteer activities within their communities. And my favorite statistic coming out of the Mentoring Effect report was that 90% of the youth that participated shared that they had an interest in becoming mentors themselves. So if we think about the rippling effect of what this research tells us, uh, if we are there to support young people as they are growing up, they in turn will be there to support the next generation uh, of youth as well. So I'm going to jump into the very first section, which is an overview of the STEM supplement to the elements of effective practice for mentoring. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Mike Geringer, who's going to lead us through this section. Mike? Great. Thank you, Dan. It's great to be with everyone today. And I'm really excited to talk about uh, not only this particular STEM supplement, but a, a new line of products and tools for the mentoring field that uh, this supplement is actually the, the first of. So um, exciting times for us. Um, and for those of you that are a little unfamiliar with uh, the elements of effective practice, that is... Um, our kind of signature program quality uh, improvement tool. Uh, it's been the cornerstone of our work with programs for uh, that quarter century that Dan mentioned earlier. And so 
very excited about the updates that we're making to it. Um, we'll talk about this today. Um, Want to give a big shout out to a number of folks that were instrumental in putting together the supplement we'll be talking about. Um, first and foremost, our partners at Genentech um, were just fabulous um, in terms of providing uh, support to this effort. Um, and not just through their generous resources, but also through bringing a real spirit of kind of uh, learning and curiosity to this. Um, the STEM mentoring field has grown a lot in the last you know decade or so, and uh, I think they bring a real intellectual curiosity to like what are the practices that make this work effective for for young people. And so none of this would be possible without. Uh, their involvement and their their partnership. You'll see here the project team. I had a number of um, other researchers and co-authors on the project, including our our good partners Janice and Rebecca at, at IRT down in North Carolina. And then, as we'll talk about and hear from a number of them today, our working group of practitioners and program representatives, as well as a couple of other researchers there you see. And, and they were really instrumental in bringing um, their expertise and kind of on the ground practitioner wisdom to this project. So big thanks to everybody on this slide. Uh, we can move on to the next slide, Dan. And I wanted to talk a little bit about why we developed this supplement. I mean, we often think of the elements of effective practice for mentoring as kind of the you know 10 commandments of running a mentoring program, so to speak. Uh, but I think one of the things that's become apparent to me over the last decade in particular is that the mentoring field has really diversified um, and grown into a kind of a cornerstone youth uh, prevention and intervention strategy that you see in a, a number of contexts. And it's hard to come up with a list of best practices that is globally applicable to every single instance and the wide variety of young people that are served by mentoring programs. Um, certainly STEM mentoring is something that has grown a lot in popularity over the last decade. And it's really around kind of two main threads, right? One is in general, the United States is lagging far behind many other countries in terms of our students' achievement in, in math, science, and, and related fields. And so there's this kind of national effort uh, broadly to kind of increase our, our effectiveness um, in what we're teaching young people in these areas. There's also the issue of underrepresentation, where women, uh, members of certain uh, minority groups, uh, youth with disabilities, often wind up underrepresented in STEM fields, STEM education opportunities. And so as a result, mentoring, I think, is increasingly being applied to this. Um, but it's been a little bit of a wild west out there. And I think there was you know, a lot of question about, well, what are the best practices for doing this particular type of mentoring with these end goals in mind? So that's why we started uh, down this path to developing this supplement. If you go to the next slide, Dan, I'll talk just briefly about the process that we went through in, in developing it. Um, most everything that we do for the elements of effective practice is grounded in real research. So evaluations, things that have really tried to suss out what works in a programmatic context. Uh, you can see here we started with a pretty thorough literature review, um, but unfortunately it was a little bit light on the type of rigorous research that we like to see and kind of base our recommendations for programs around. Um, but we were able to put together a a pretty good uh, list of, of literature. I think in the end, we wound up with about 208, somewhere in that ballpark, uh, articles and, and research reports that informed the findings that we're going to share today. Um, unfortunately, I think more evaluation is needed. And when you see the final supplement, uh, you'll see that there's a section in which we encourage the field to kind of dive into more uh, evaluation and, and try and um, help us grow our body of knowledge around this. Um, I wanted to then talk about the role of this working group. We're going to hear from three folks uh, whose programs were part of that working group today. Um, and they were really critical in suggesting practices that were meaningful to their work, things that they had seen work 
in practice um, and helped us fill in those gaps where the research literature was perhaps unclear. And even in some cases, they rejected suggestions that we may have, have drawn from that research literature, which is, yeah, that's a good idea on paper, but we tried it and it didn't work for these reasons. So they were really helpful in helping us, I think, come up with a set of recommended practices that are achievable, but also I think push the field forward a little bit in terms of their uh, quality and, and what they're offering young people and, and mentors. Um, the full supplement uh, is moving into desktop publishing right now. In fact, I'm working on that later today. Um, we anticipate that it'll be out next month, sometime in June. Uh, but I will note that we do have a handout available that kind of summarizes all of the practice recommendations in the full guide. And that is available on the right hand side. There's a handout panel there. I believe you can just download the PDF directly from there. Uh, but the full product will have, you know, kind of, uh, you know, full essays kind of explaining why we're recommending what we're recommending and other uh, kind of advice for, for programs working in this space. Um, one of the things you'll find, if you go to the next slide, Dan, is a general typology of STEM mentoring. And I, I feel like it was important with this guide to kind of define what we mean by STEM mentoring. There's a lot of STEM education programming happening out there, but we wanted to really put some you know, definition around you know, things that were very relationship centric and had a real mentoring component to them. And I think just broadly looking at that field, um, it was more diverse than I would have expected. Um, you can see programs worked on a number of different areas, kind of closely correlated with how old the young people in the program were. Um, but, you know, really what we found, I think, most lacking, and I, unfortunately we have a, an example of it today um, with Genentech, is, you know, programs that are connecting the dots across that age spectrum. There are most of what we saw in the research literature were programs targeting middle schoolers, but not really emphasizing what happens perhaps after they, they leave that program. So I think there are areas for growth and and coordination in this field. Um, so the supplement does offer kind of this typology of STEM mentoring, and I think folks will see their work represented in there. And hopefully for funders or others that want to get involved in STEM mentoring, that will help them kind of hit the mark with their investments and their efforts. So without further ado, I want to dive into um, some of the recommendations that you'll find in the supplement. Now, we're not going to cover everything that is on that handout today, but we did want to kind of call out some ones that we felt were key recommendations. And these follow kind of the six areas of the elements of effective practice. And we'll just kind of walk through them here and give our panelists an opportunity to really talk about their work in a, a good way. Um, in terms of recruitment and screening, there's kind of two pathways that programs tend to take. They either recruit STEM professionals uh, and put them into the mentoring role or perhaps STEM graduate students or students, undergrads even, uh, working with kind of, you know, K-12 students. Um, and a lot of programs certainly, you know, uh, focused on that. And you'll see the second bullet here is really making sure that if you're recruiting mentors from institutional settings that, you know, there aren't going to be scheduling conflicts and other things that get in the way from them actually serving as a mentor. We also found examples, though, of programs that were recruiting folks that are not necessarily STEM professionals or, or older students, um, lay people in the, this role so that they could actually learn alongside the young people in the program and kind of grow their STEM knowledge together. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Katie here to talk a little bit about the work of C Research. I think the fall into that that latter example. So Katie, could you tell us a little bit about the folks you recruit? Sure, yeah, certainly, and, and we certainly do, Mike. Um, but just to back up a, just a bit, um, so uh, just a little bit about Sea Research Foundation's STEM mentoring program. Our program is uh, designed for youth ages 6 to 10, um, and the program is designed to be operated in a group mentoring context where you have four youth mentees with either an adult or teen peer mentor working with that group consistently uh, over the course of at least one year and um, meeting at least uh, for one hour per week over, that, over the course of that year. 
Um, this program is funded through a multi-state mentoring grant through the Department of Justice's Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, and as such is operated in um, over 100 uh, high-need communities across uh, the nation, including Alaska, Hawaii, and, and Puerto Rico. Um, by providing consistent, high-quality STEM-focused mentoring experiences, the STEM mentoring program encourages a reduction in high-risk behaviors, improvement of academic success indicators, and an overall increase in knowledge of and interest in STEM topics and careers. Um, so going to Mike's question on the next slide, um, how do we handle mentor recruitment and, and screening in our, in our process, in our program? Um, we find for our program, our, our, one of our major goals in program design is to make the STEM content um, the vehicle for delivering the mentoring relationship and making sure that that isn't in any way threatening to any mentor or mentee. And so we go to great lengths to create the curricular materials and the training associated with it, which we do as a blended model of in-person training with program coordinators and also um, extensive ongoing online webinar training um, with our program coordinators at each site. And then they work with their uh, mentors on site. Um, so it, it's equally accessible to a uh, PhD scientist or uh, undergraduate or graduate student um, in the STEM fields or someone who has had no experience at all with STEM. Um, and particularly with, given with this age group that we're working with, um, that really makes it accessible to, to, all, to embrace all mentors. Because really what we want is that dedicated patient and caring role model um, to be there for uh, these young people for, for, a, for the length of the program. So it's really making that time commitment that's the most essential for us and that they want to and like working with uh, young people. Um, so we really use, a, uh, our sites, half of our sites use peer teen mentors, um, half use adult, and then there is a combination of sites that use, uh, and we think this is a great model, uh, they pair an adult community-based mentor with a teen or peer mentor. Um, a lot of our sites have a teen population as part of their community, and it makes for a great uh, mentor for the younger students in the program who really can then um, see someone who is from their community and relate to them, um, but also in an ideal world, have an adult as part of that relationship and mentoring experience as well. Great, thank you, Katie. Um, and I love the fact that you guys really like, hey, we need folks that are going to show up and uh, be mentors, not just folks that can kind of, you know, tackle the science piece of it. Um, so uh, it's a great, great practice. Um, Ragnar, I wanted to, to toss it over to you and talk a little bit about uh, the folks that you bring in as mentors in your program. Thanks, Mike. So um, Mike mentioned that at Genentech, we're really trying to connect those dots. And for our overall future lab program, we're really working with students in the South San Francisco district, K through 12. Um, and, you know, working in South San Francisco isn't an easy place to go to school. There's few resources. Teachers are underpaid. Classrooms are packed. Students have a lot of their own challenges. Almost 40% qualify for free or reduced lunch, and 30% of those kids are also English language learners. So this slide here, I'd like to just call out our Gene Academy Elementary School program, which is our on-site mentoring program for students who are bused on campus weekly for an entire academic year, and they're meeting up with two volunteer mentors, the same mentors, and they're doing basic homework help plus alternating with fun, blow it up science. And, and I wanted to say that we just gave away one of our biggest secrets for mentoring success. We have two mentors per student, not just one. And you see in this slide, uh, two of the mentors for the student. And this may sound like we're being wasteful. I mean, couldn't you just mentor more kids? Well, no. For many years, our program was really flat at 80 mentors, and it was kind of understandable because committing to meet with a student one hour for 26 weeks is huge. And, and frankly, that scared away a lot of our employees. But when we shifted over to a two-to-one model, we really began to recruit mentors with a message of, hey, come share the responsibility and the reward. 
And we were able to grow our program 30% annually. Now we've maxed out our cafeterias with 400 uh, volunteers, um, and we're turning them away. And I think the benefits are huge. I think they're hitting back to these key um, points that Mike made. You know, students have two role models, right? Two different views of the world, glimpses into two different jobs that employees have at a big company like Genentech. Um, Co-mentors also are really solving the logistical challenges of supporting a student on a weekly basis, right? They're making sure that one of them is always there for their mentee. And then third, I think we're really recruiting a majority of non-scientists at Genentech. So these are folks who are having fun, they're relearning STEM concepts along the way with their mentees. Most volunteers come to mentor first and then to inspire the love of science second. And so only about 10% of our mentors here are actual scientists. So we have a far greater employee pool to pull from. To pull from. Back to you, Mike. Awesome. Thank you. And I, and I love the creative way that you guys um, handled that commitment piece, right, by, by sharing kind of the responsibility. As you noted, that also has benefits for the young person as well. Um, Michael, talk a little bit about the folks that uh, you bring into Science Club. Sure. So what um, I'd like to share are really amplifying themes that both Ragnar and Katie shared. Um, just by way of background, Science Club is an after-school mentoring program for middle school students, roughly ages 10 to 13, so the next, uh, I guess, age category up from the work that Katie and Ragnar are doing. Um, the students come from high-needs communities in Chicago and Evanston, and Science Club was started in spring of 2008, so this is actually our 10th anniversary of the program this spring. The reason that we focused on the middle school years is that these are a particularly important time for building identity around STEM careers and skills. Uh, the research literature is very clear on this. And our community partners, Boys and Girls Clubs of Chicago and Chicago Public Schools, also seconded in their local classrooms and their youth development centers, they were seeing this disengagement with science accelerating during the middle school year. So, our core educational strategy involves longitudinal authentic mentoring provided by science and engineering students and staff from Chicago area universities. Um, they work weekly in collaborative groups at community sites, so in spaces that are comfortable for the kids. We've actually built laboratories at several of the Boys and Girls Club sites. And the mentors work collaboratively with kids on engaging inquiry-based curricula. Um, the groups are two mentors and four youth. And as Ragnar was bringing up earlier, uh, some have criticized us for why can't you have one mentor with four youth instead of two mentor with four youth. But as Ragnar pointed out, uh, the redundancy um, in providing support is really important for ensuring that when mentors move on, they graduate, that they're still a member of that group who helps hold it together and let's face it, coming in and doing work and after school with middle school kids can be challenging at times. And it's a really great way for our mentors to really train brand new mentors. So existing um, staff serving to help train new ones. Our selection process, um, we focused on the commitment first and foremost. Um, everyone who works in the mentoring field is concerned about preserving the match. We do look for people who have science backgrounds or can um, or feel comfortable teaching some of the concepts using the science and engineering practices that are called for in the next-gen science standards, um, although you certainly don't have to be a discipline expert in our curricula. The commitment that we ask for is one year. Um, because the program runs at community sites, this has meant that some types of volunteers, the timing doesn't work. Uh, the community sites often start at between 4 and 5 o'clock, and so this makes it challenging for even undergraduate students who's, who might be STEM undergrads, but whose laboratory schedules, academic schedules change quarter to quarter. Um, so predominantly, we're using graduate students and staff in our programs. We're also looking for some experience with youth. Um, again, it can be incredibly rewarding and fun, but there are also challenges. And so just being at least aware of those, and most importantly for us, it's a willingness to learn, to be open to feedback, 
education is, I would say, by far one of the most armchair quarterback fields on the planet. And so everyone thinks that their academic path is the right one for the next generation of kids. And there are a lot of factors that, that fold in here, cultural awareness, equity, and you know, let's face it, many of our STEM students don't come from the backgrounds that we're looking to, uh, to grow in the STEM field. So um, I would just like to close by saying that willingness to learn is really, really important. Great. Thank you, Mike. And I love the fact that all three of you run really different programs that are bringing in different types of adults to, to fill this role, or in, in Katie's case, even young people themselves in that mentor role. But all of you have found a way to make sure that your mentors really are mentors, uh, first and foremost, and that they can kind of meet the expectations of the program. In my experience, that's where many mentoring programs simply struggle is just in getting uh, people there and, and getting them to, to be committed to what needs to happen for, for young people. I want to move on to the next kind of topic area that we talk about in the, the guide, and that is training. And this wound up being the lengthiest section in our recommendations. We had a lot to say here. Um, and I'm going to quickly kind of highlight a some of the areas in which we really thought mentors in STEM programs uh, needed perhaps some extra training beyond what you might get in a, a typical mentoring program that's kind of just more generally youth development focused. Um, the two bullets that you see here is really have to do with that thing I mentioned earlier, which is recognizing that your program and the mentor you provide is really only one piece of a larger puzzle that will span many, many years of a young person's journey into STEM education and, and hopefully eventually a, a STEM career. Um, so we really suggest that mentors be trained on being a connector or an advocate uh, for their mentees, connecting them to other programs, people, places, other mentors um, that they shouldn't feel like it is their sole responsibility to get this young person to a, a, um, a STEM you know, lifetime. Um, and really training young people themselves to go out and find more mentors. I mean, I think the biggest gift any mentoring program can teach young people, the biggest gift they can provide is teaching them to go find the next mentor and the mentor after that. So we definitely recommend that here. On the next slide, um, you'll see that we also recommend um, some kind of what I would call kind of practical training, um, things around facilitating the STEM activities. Uh, what do we do when we get together and we have to do some experiment and making sure that mentors are clear on on how to do that, do that in a safe way so that um, no one's you know, getting a chemical burn or anything like that as part of it. Um, but also even things like you know, learning to not use technical vocabulary with your mentees. You get a bunch of scientists doing sciencey things and they can quickly kind of uh, go with nomenclature or professional jargon and making sure that they're helping the young people follow along and, and really understand the concepts being taught. Um, another set of recommendations had to do with something that a few of our panelists here have, have mentioned, if we go to the next slide, and that is really uh, deeper training around how to work with young people and, and work with young people that often may not be coming from a, a background or life experience where, you know, being in a, a laboratory setting or, or a higher ed setting is comfortable and familiar. And so, you know, providing extra training around things like cultural awareness and, and you know, humility, um, supporting feelings of belonging. I think half of the battle with getting young people to consider a science or a STEM, you know, pathway is just, do they feel like they belong in that world? And how do I bring that out in a young person? Um, being willing to talk about you know, barriers and struggles that mentors themselves have faced in, in their own STEM journey. Um, and then working around things like mindsets and getting young people to feel like um, STEM is an area where they can succeed. These are all skills that I think often don't come naturally to adults. Um, and so I think we really promoted a need to do some extra training for mentors in these types of programs. Um, I wanna turn things over to Katie here to talk a little bit about how you prepare those mentors to, to come in and work with the students you're serving. Yeah, thanks, Mike. So, you know, I would say that our, our training is, uh, is, is early and ongoing. So, you know, we try to pair 
um, as I said, um, in-person training with online webinar training, and all of our sites participate in both. Um, but before uh, entering into the program, all mentors uh, do pr participate in a training event, and that is as much about um, what it means to be a mentor um, as it is uh, certainly more than that than it is about um, STEM content. As they get into the program, then, you know, as they start new modules that relate to STEM content, then we, you know, feed them that content training as well. But we continue to um, reinforce the best practices of effective mentoring um, with this group and support them throughout the duration. And, you know, there's there's been some, you know, interesting themes that have been coming up to you know, reinforce. And you know, I, it, you know, we always hear that the, the scariest thing about being a mentor is not knowing what you're going to do with the mentees. And so we take that right off the table with our program. And it sounds like the other panelists sort of do the same thing by providing these very structured activities. And the research shows that the mentoring relationship evolves and forms through that bonding exercise between mentors and mentees by doing those activities. And it releases a lot of the initial concern or tension because as we all see, there's always going to be a greater demand for mentors, a greater need for mentors in, in, in these communities and to solve some of these issues around underrepresentation in STEM. Uh, then we have in the population, I think it's about 1% of the population, uh, volunteers to be mentors. So as long as we can all help to reduce those barriers and make the mentoring experience positive and successful for mentors, then hopefully we can inch that number and that percentage up so that all of the youth who um, would really benefit from mentors can ultimately have, have some in their lives. Awesome. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, and Ragnar, I know one of the things that we highlight in the the actual supplement is uh, some of the ongoing training stuff that you all are putting together at, at Genentech. Would you mind sharing a little bit about those kind of ongoing trainings that you offer your mentors? Whoops. I need to take my thing off pause here. Uh, I'm back. So, sure, Mike. So, uh, you know, as Katie mentioned, being a great mentor doesn't just happen because you show up at a volunteer orientation. You know, at Genentech, we train up mentors actually on a on a weekly basis via emails, right? So right before the session, we send them, hey, this is what you're going to be doing. It's a science week, and here's what you're going to do, or it's a math and, and language arts um, day. And we usually also add in thought questions that really are going to guide the mentors on how to connect with their mentees. Like something like, you know, this week, tell your student about a challenge that you're having, you know, and then ask them about something that they're struggling with, right? We're actually potentially this year going to be piloting with a text-based approach to this. So right before mentors go into their three o'clock session on Monday or Thursday, they're going to get a text that's going to say, Think about this one thought. Utilize this one concept for mentoring. Um, and, you know, we, we know that mentors love to learn. And, in fact, 91% of our employee volunteers reported that they were actually able to strengthen skills or build new ones as a result of our programs. So there's really a win-win here for both mentees and mentors. And as a company, we're always looking for that. Make sure we're benefiting on both sides of that equation. I would say another best practice that we have is our booster session trainings for volunteers on how to be better mentors. We gather them all up. These are always non-STEM topics. This year we did two booster sessions. One was on identifying their unconscious biases, right? And then also giving them strategies for how to overcome them. And then the second was, on, like Mike said, was on growth mindset. And how do you encourage students to embrace failure? One of the simplest ways that we've put growth mindset into practice is by embracing a tiny word, and that's yet. And so it's actually become almost an inside joke uh, within our programs. I don't know how to do X or Y, dun, 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 yet. Uh, back to you, Mike. I love it. And for folks that want to do more growth mindset uh, work in their mentoring programs, we actually uh, have a toolkit on that where mentors can learn online a little bit more about growth mindset. And it's got a great section on the word yet. So happy to hear that you guys are doing that as well. 
I want to move on to matching. Now, we have a lot of recommendations in the final product around matching, around you know which uh, you know which scientist or researcher might be a good fit for a particular student, depending on what they want to study or or learn about. But I think today I want to focus on something that came up uh, that I didn't expect, but I think is is an excellent point that our working group brought up, and that's for yeah, a lot of programs working in this space use a group model, and we've certainly heard from our panelists today. Um, about the kind of group approaches that they're taking. And really just a reminder to programs to pay attention to group dynamics when making those matches. Um, and in particular, um, perhaps, you know, having a little bit of a, a trial period for that group to interact a little bit, allow the program staff to see, you know, how are the interactions? Did we just by random chance put you know, four shy kids together. <laughs> They're really struggling with, with that. So, uh, Katie, I know that this was something that we we borrowed from your work at at C Research, and I'm hoping you can tell folks a little bit about how and why you've you've tackled this issue. Yeah. So, um, you know, you, you you group four kids and a mentor together, and you're not really sure if you're going to get a science experiment that you know blows up or is a, has a you know sort of a successful conclusion there. So, you know, program coordinators in our program would occasionally like report having difficulty creating these sort of flourishing and long-lasting matches that engaged all participants. You know, sometimes the five different personalities wouldn't complement each other as intended, but you know, would create an unexpected group dynamic that might leave mentees feeling, you know, more frustrated than excited. Um, and they would certainly do their best through coordinators, through applications, inter interviews, and their own intuition to create groups that worked, um, but didn't always translate into real life. So um, it, once these groups were established, mentors and mentees would complete three modules together that lasted each eight to 12 weeks. Um, and they were often, and rightfully so, reluctant to modify these groups midway because the whole purpose is to build that lasting and sustainable relationship. So for the reasons above, we decided to develop a new module that would kickstart the interactions or the programmatic pieces uh, of STEM mentoring. Um, and in that, this was a four-week mini-module that would take place before the first full-length module begins. Program coordinators were, would create their, their groups for this mini-module with the expectation that participants may shift and reconfigure before the formal program begins. If the group works well, they can remain together for the remaining three modules. However, if negative group dynamics distract participants from the STEM activities, or impede positive relationships building among mentors and mentees, the program coordinator can then reconfigure the groups before the first full-length module begins. Um, so the mini module is long enough that the groups have a good chance to work through issues and find their momentum, but not so long that group members have to spend too much time in matches that may not be ideal. And it's really interesting, after the mini module concluded, um, the program coordinators you know, would assess the group. And interestingly, um, when we surveyed our program coordinators, 44% um, um, or nearly half of them actually did end up reconfiguring their group um, and use this trial period as really as a way to assess all the personalities and then be able to establish groups for whatever reason, and they were many, um, that would be most effective mentor and mentee uh, relationships throughout. So that's sort of the next slide just kind of gives a few uh, um, reactions from some of our some of our program coordinators about that but I've pretty much uh, summarized that but they appreciated having that opportunity and there was sort of no, nothing was lost in the process because they were doing these mentor building relationships for half the session stem activities which really introduced them to the s t e and m of stem um, so if kids were or mentors were really unfamiliar you know starting from really ground zero with what is what is stem um, it really helped scaffold those um, that knowledge base and that and those relationship base and then they were ready to start more of the thematic stem programs with the right configuration of mentors and mentees and with enough sort of background knowledge about what STEM is to feel confident and be successful throughout the remainder of the year. Awesome. Thank you, Katie. Um, and I love uh, this approach. And I think particularly for group programs, you know, this is really critical because 
Um, I, I have a sneaking suspicion that most of the mechanism of change in, in a group mentoring context is actually from the interactions that those young people have with one another as much as it is with their mentor. And so making sure that you've got a good blend there, I, I feel like is, is critical. Um, we have two other categories of recommendations, and I think we can get through these quick, Dan, and, and move on to questions and answers here. So I want to make sure the audience is sending in their, their questions if they've got them. Um, the working group was really helpful around monitoring and support. There was almost nothing in the research literature about effective strategies for kind of monitoring matches to make sure that they were both, you know, safe, but also making sure that the young people and the mentors are getting what they had hoped out of the experience and that they weren't ha you know, having lingering issues that uh, were going unaddressed. And so um, you see the recommendation here about providing kind of real time monitoring and support, particularly in programs where they're doing a lot of kind of hands on experiments or activities that, you know, could go one way or another and, and making sure that, um, you know, not only are those activities going well, but that the relationships are kind of moving along and, and you know, kind of free of conflict as well. Um, and Michael, I wanted to throw it over to you to talk a little bit about how you kind of do that, that real-time mentor support in your work. Yes. Real-time support for us has been absolutely critical. Uh, it was the mentors themselves who fairly early on in our program design indicated that the quarterly mentor trainings we were doing, the new mentor onboarding sessions, even brown bag sessions on topics of interest to mentors that would help them be more effective uh, at our boys and girls clubs were simply not enough. And I think this is in part a product of the age group that we work with. So the three young men who you see on this uh, slide here, outstanding individuals, super fun to engage with. Um, but like any kids in the middle school years, this is a challenging time for them, right? The, their bodies are developing rapidly. Uh, they can be a little moody. They can be even flat out mean sometimes. And so having a person who is experienced in the space when um, maybe conversations aren't headed in a positive direction or kids bring up things that are inappropriate, having a professional in a space who can come over to a table that looks like it might be struggling and help do some modeling, whether this is about a conversation that's taking place, maybe a mentor is a little panicked on how to answer a particular question or for the quarter in which we focus on kids science fair experiments maybe it's really outside of their discipline and they're having trouble coming up with a solution at the moment and the 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 student is being impatient there's an opportunity to get some support there are also challenging situations which arise uh, these could be personal matters they could be um, the kinds of things where you'd like to have an experienced professional there to help broker and move things in a positive direction is probably the best way to say it. The other piece for recognizing or having an adult person in the space, um, a support staff member, is that oftentimes the work can be trying. And there are, are certainly periods where mentors don't feel like a particular session was productive or they're starting to feel, wonder if this kind of work is really worth the effort that they're putting in. And it is, they won't, the mentors won't always bring that to us. And so it's important that we have somebody there who can read body language and who can have those quick informal conversations after a session is over to unpack what happened if things didn't look like they went very well. And this has really helped us preserve mentors in the program because almost everybody comes in very, very excited. And during the first quarter when the relationship is being built, often their um, enthusiasm heads southward. So it's up to us to really recognize that, to help put the bigger picture in focus and uh, to support them and in turn support the kids. Awesome, thank you, Michael. And, and I have to say, as the parent of a middle schooler, I think I have experienced all of those things that you mentioned in the last 24 hours myself. So um, I, I love the approach that you guys take to uh, making sure that everything is, is, is on track for, for your matches. Um, I wanted to also ask Katie, you know, to talk a little bit about kind of the monitoring that you do knowing you're working with, with slightly younger students. 
Yeah, I would say that um, everything that Michael said for middle school students is true in a somewhat different way for the elementary age students uh, that we're working with as as mentees. And the I couldn't agree more. You know, we operate our programs in um, after school programs as well in public spaces, um, many of which are boys and girls clubs, YMCA's, and after school programs. And we always have a, a staff professional overseeing these sessions. So it really takes the weight off of the mentors to be the disciplinarians, to be everything to those groups. Because you can imagine that if there's um, three groups of four and sometimes more up to six groups of four mentees ages six to ten and and mentors you really need someone to oversee the whole situation to be able to um, lead off the activity um, to meet with those mentors beforehand briefly to set them up for success and then to check in with them afterwards to um, process the experience and see if there's any lesson learned in ways in which we can, uh, you know, make improvements to to uh, their role there. Because again, as as Michael said, you want these people to stay on, you want them to be happy. And when we survey our our mentors, 99% um, of them said that they had a positive mentoring experience and they would continue in mentoring. And you know, that's the kind of mentors that you want to be cultivating. You know, they're like donors in a sense. You have to really cultivate those relationships um, and and they're the ones you need to focus on as much as recruiting new mentors. New mentors are harder to uh, recruit than it is to retain your existing mentors. So so put your program design to work so that that is planned into it. And clearly Science Club is doing that and we strive to do that in our STEM mentoring program as well. Awesome and excellent, excellent words of wisdom around viewing your mentors the way you would donors. Um, I couldn't agree more. Uh, precious relationships to be sure. So fittingly, I want to end with closure um, and, you know, really go back to a point that I made at the beginning of this presentation, which was we saw very little in kind of the research literature in this field around programs that were really trying to connect the dots across kind of the the childhood and into young adulthood span for young people. Um, and that's, you know, hard. Not, not many folks are in a position to offer a 12 year mentoring relationship with a STEM professional. But what I encourage folks to do and what we recommend in the guide is that programs can be much more intentional about making that handoff to the next program, um, the next mentor. Um, and so you see a couple of recommendations here about kind of partnering with other programs so that you can do that handoff, um, but also then teaching those young people how to find and and ask someone to be their next mentor, uh, because no matter where they go in life, whether it's STEM or otherwise, they're going to need that skill and, and benefit from that skill. Uh, but I did want to close with with Ragnar talking a little bit about, I think, something that Genentech has done that's innovative, where you have tried to provide a range of programming across uh, childhood and adolescence for the young people in, in San Francisco. So I'm, I'm hoping you can close us up by, by sharing that. Sure, Mike. So, yeah, you know, at Genentech, we, I think we take a particularly long view with our giving and our volunteering and our mentoring. And, and really, because we do have a long view, for our medicines, it takes up to 20 years to go through discovery and development, manufacturing, com approval, commercialization, right? So we really shouldn't be so surprised that it takes that long to really grow a student into a scientist, right? So, um, Future Lab is a commitment of K through 12, and there's about 10 different activities you, we do. You see three of them here, and I talked already to Gene Academy, which was our elementary school flavor. Uh, Gene Academy is an after-school program. Helix Cup and Science Garage are both done in school. Um, for Helix Cup, every eighth grader participates in an annual science competition, and employee coaches are going into classrooms they're mentoring the same students over a six long, month long science competition where students are solving design challenges like egg drops and bridge builds and robot designs, et cetera. We do a lot of fun there. So kids are here, kids are actually in Gene Academy learning that science is fun. Helix Cup, they're learning they can do it. In high school, Science Garage, um, 
is where South San Francisco students can take up to four years of biotech classes that we've co-created with the school district. Volunteer TAs, again, we have about 150, are matched with one classroom for the year, and they're sharing their lab technique expertise. They're providing real world relevance about what the students are learning and saying, hey, when you do that, we do this at Genentech. They're also talking about their life path, their successes, their failures via mini lectures. And over a thousand students are participating in Science Garage each year. So really trying to connect those dots um, is something that you know we're trying. Uh, and I think in years to come, we hope to do some sort of longitudinal study so that we can demonstrate the impact of this, uh, this program. Awesome. Thank you. And I, I hope folks have enjoyed hearing from all of our panelists. Thank you uh, to each of you for kind of sharing a little bit about your work. And there's a lot more about each of our uh, participating programs in the full supplement. So I really encourage folks to check that out when it comes out. There's a lot more to say about the good work that all of you are, are doing. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. I'm just going to jump in. There's one question that uh, has come up a couple times from participants on today's session, and that is if the panelists have any recommendations on sources where they can identify STEM activities to complement their mentoring work. So if there's a source that you use often or that you turn to for STEM-based activities, if you could share that with the team. Well, Dan, I think one of the things I'll chime in here, one of the things that I came across in um, doing background research for this supplement was there were many programs that made kind of their activity guides available online. Um, so just by kind of hunting and pecking around in Google, I was able to find a number of those. I know the Starbase program, which I believe is run through the National Guard, um, they make their full curriculum available online uh, to anyone who'd like to use it. So um, you can find things like that out there on online, but um, I'm sure some of our panelists here have go-to sources for experiments and that type of thing. Yeah, and Dan, I'm happy to share that at Genentech, we work very closely with Science Buddies for our Helix Cup competition. Um, and then for our uh, Gene Academy, we work closely with Rocket Science to create all of the content uh, for our weekly science sessions. Awesome, thanks so much, Ragnar. Uh, Mike Kennedy here. I will just add that um, we ended up had we ended up developing our own curricula because we wanted we wanted student voice to foster into the curricula. So we asked the kids what kinds of things they were interested in learning about. And second, we really wanted to focus the curricula on skill building and develop them in a way that they could be flexibly implemented for a range of student learners. So we get kids who are very much at the low end of the achievement scale. We get kids at very much the high end of the achievement scale. So curricula that were adaptable enough that they could meet the needs of kids across those ability levels. So our curricula are available for free from our site. You can go to Science Club and, and look at these, but um, they're not curricula that are designed to be implemented like proscriptively step by step by step. It's more of a framework and then we leave it up to the mentors to actually do the teaching. Great, thanks Mike. So I'll just, uh, I'll commit to making sure that I send out to everybody with the recording as well as the handout on the supplement to the elements of effective practice, uh, some links to some of those sources that folks have shared. Uh, just in closing, I want to just highlight on the screen right now the, the websites for each of the three programs that have been featured today as part of the supplement showing how research has been brought into practice. And so really encourage you to check out each of these sites uh, to really dive deeper into their work within the STEM mentoring space. Uh, they really are exemplary programs that we hold up. Uh, and have, there's a lot more content around their programs and around their practices that will be featured in the full supplement, as Mike Derringer has shared earlier, which will be available on mentoring.org uh, in June. And then just in closing, I just encourage you, if you enjoyed today's session, to, to check out some additional resources from Mentor. We run the online uh, community of practice for corporations and foundations and donors. There's the Mentoring Connector that if your program is looking for mentors, to make sure you take advantage of this national database where you can list your mentoring opportunities. 
and at Mentor and our affiliates across the country are constantly promoting the, this tool and driving people to it in order to connect with those local programs in your communities. Uh, beyond that, I just want to say a huge thank you to our panelists today and a big huge thank you to Mike Geringer for helping to facilitate and moderate through today's. Uh, we had a lot of content, as you saw. Uh, there's a lot more in the uh, short version of the supplement as well as the full version that's coming out in June. And then just I want to also give a shout out to Ragnar and his colleague Eileen from Genentech, uh, working with companies across the country. Um, we, we just want to hold them up as a star example of a company that does hold true to the long view. And not only do they have incredible STEM-based mentoring programs, but they support the teachers and the schools in a variety of ways, everything from partnering them with Donors Choose to providing access to additional professional development. So just a really good, solid investment on multiple levels. Um, and it is what ultimately makes programs like the C Research Foundation and the Science Club and other programs across the country, that type of philanthropy that makes these programs possible and helps us to reach more young people across the country. So to all of our, our panelists, Mike, Katie, Ragnar, Mike Geringer, and to all of you for joining today, a big, huge thank you and look forward to seeing you next time. Take care.